Welcome everyone. My name is Tim Massett. I am a research fellow here at HKS and also the director of the Digital Assets Policy Project, which we started recently to do a couple of things. One, to organize events like this around the general subject of digital assets policy, and also to use the convening power of the university to advance the policy discussions in this area. And just to highlight, uh, we have a website. You can see what we're, uh, what events we're organizing. But the next one will be um, April first, second, <laughs> first. Thank you, Josh. Uh, April first with Jeremy Allaire, who is the CEO of Circle, uh, the issuer of the second largest stablecoin. Um, and that I believe is at four o'clock in the afternoon. Is I believe. Um, yeah, anyway, it'll be up on our website soon. It's not there yet, but it will be soon. Okay, so, but today we are very, very fortunate to have with us uh, Ross Leckow, who has flown in from Basel. Um, he is the deputy head of the Innovation Hub at the Bank for International Settlements. Now, you'll hear more about the BIS and the Innovation Hub. Ross, I'm sure, can do a better job describing both than I can, but if you're not familiar with the BIS, it is an international organization. It has 60 member central banks, and it basically fosters international monetary and financial cooperation, does a lot of work with central banks across a whole range of areas. Ross joined uh, uh, the BIS in 2019 uh, as, uh, I guess, a senior, you were originally senior advisor for FinTech. Um, and he was at the uh, International Monetary Fund from 1990 to 2019, where he was Deputy General Counsel. He's a University of Winnipeg uh, graduate and holds law degrees from both the University of Manitoba and York University. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Ross, who's going to speak for about 30 minutes. Um, let me also introduce, my apologies, Hal Jackson. Uh, uh, Hal is professor of law uh, at the uh, law school, and uh, Hal and I will ask Ross a few questions, but also invite you all to ask questions as well. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Tim. First of all, can everybody hear me okay? Let me start by saying what a, a great pleasure it is for me to be here at the Kennedy School. I'd like to thank the Kennedy School and Tim Massad and, and Hal Jackson for, for inviting me. Um, what I would like to do um, today is to, to share with you um, important work that's being done by central banks and by the innovation, BIS Innovation Hub, uh, where I work, to basically shape uh, the future of money and payments. And I'd like to do this by focusing on a particular um, area of payments that requires a lot of fixing, the area of cross-border payments. I should say up front that what I will say uh, are my own views and may not necessarily represent those of the, of the BIS. What I would like to do is to start with um, a brief introduction to the current state of play with money and payments. I'll then give you a brief overview of the BIS Innovation Hub before turning to the challenges of cross-border payments. And I'll then focus on two ways in which central banks and the BIS Innovation Hub are seeking to address um, problems in this space. First of all, by enabling the new, as we call it, through central bank digital currencies or CBDC. Then by improving the old, uh, by uh, trying to upgrade existing um, frameworks for the making of cross-border payments. Then I'll, I'll finish with a brief conclusion. Before I get into money and payments, I think I should start by stating the obvious, which is that times have changed and of course, they're changing fast. And when I was a student a very long time ago, you know, if, for example, if one wanted to go to a movie, you had to go to a movie theater, you had to look in the newspaper to see uh, what was playing, or you had to pick up a landline and phone the movie theater to ask what they were showing. You know, I don't know anybody who calls a movie theater today. And most of us would take up, pick up our cell phone, look at what's playing and probably book our tickets online or better yet, probably stream it at home. Well, I think that demonstrates how every aspect of our lives is being changed by technology. And this includes in the world of money and payments. 
over the centuries, we've moved from a world in which uh, people relied upon uh, metal coins uh, to paper money backed by precious metals like gold um, to um, uh, fiat currencies issued today by central banks to new forms of digital money that we're, that we're seeing um, in operation today. And digitization is moving us to really a 24 seven financial services universe, faster payments. But um, we're certainly not there yet. Uh, there's still a lot of frictions and, and, and pain points in the, the world of payments. And people are demanding more and better, both businesses and households. And it's for that reason, I think that uh, this, this demand is uh, fueling a huge amount of innovation at the moment, payment space particularly in the private sector. Uh, large financial institutions are experimenting with uh, um, new approaches like so-called tokenized deposits that we might talk a little bit about today. Uh, the crypto market is continuing to develop. Um, big, te big techs, big technology companies in some cases are um, uh, moving to issue their own uh, types of, um, um, th th their own mechanisms for retail payments and stable coins that are a type of cryptocurrency backed by particular assets like a, like a, 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 a fiat currency issued by a central bank are seeking regulatory approval. And finally, in the world of decentralized finance or DeFi, people are really trying to reinvent financial services. Many of these innovations are new and exciting, but many of them also carry risks. For example, with cryptocurrencies. And it's for this reason, I think, that the public sector uh, through central banks in particular, have to do their part to ensure that um, the digitization of the, of the financial system continues to progress in a way that improves services and improves offerings, but also preserves monetary and financial stability. And that the public sector can do this by regulating what's going on in the private sector, by working with the private sector, but also in circumstance, uh, certain circumstances, the public sector, particularly central banks, have to innovate themselves in building the infrastructure that will port, support the money, support money and the payment systems of tomorrow. This brings me to the BIS uh, Innovation Hub. The Innovation Hub uh, is a, an initiative, a new initiative of the Bank for International Settlements, it's four and a half years old. I should say that the BIS, as Tim mentioned, is the, the oldest international financial institution world. Uh, it was established in 1930, and it noted its membership is composed of the largest central banks in the world, including Earth. Its original purpose was actually to administer the reparations payments Germany and some other powers had to pay to the Allies after the First World War. And over the course of the last hundred years, it's reinvented itself half a dozen times, I would say. And the most recent, I think, incarnation of this reinvention was what is going on now, including through initiatives like the BIS Innovation Hub. And the Innovation Hub was basically established as a platform for collaboration among central banks. In their work with new technologies, um, their experimentations with, with new, technological, uh, new technologies like blockchain, for example, to develop solutions to problems in the financial system that central banks care about. Five years ago, it, had been, it was already clear that central banks were working a lot individually in developing their own solutions to problems that were of concern to them in the financial system. But it was recognized that if there were a platform, an international platform in a place like the BIS, where they could work together, they could be much more effective working together than they were individually. So it was against this backdrop that the BIS's board of directors in 2019 decided to set up the Innovation Hub to serve as this vehicle, vehicle for central bank collaboration. The Innovation Hub is based in Basel, uh, Basel, Switzerland, at the BIS headquarters. Uh, but it's, um, it has hub centers that are have been opened in different parts of the world, uh, each in collaboration with a host central bank or central bank. And we currently have offices in, in uh, well, six, six hub centers across seven locations. So uh, in Switzerland, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, London with the Bank of England, uh, Stockholm with the Swedish Riksbank and the Central Bank of Iceland, Norway, and Denmark, 
and with the entire Euro system and offices in Frankfurt and Paris. And in the next few months, we'll be opening the last center that we currently have plans for opening in Toronto with the Bank of Canada. And in addition to that, we have a strategic partnership with the Federal Reserve System through the New York Innovation Center of the New York Fed. What exactly does the innovation hub do? Well, its mandate really consists of three pillars. Uh, on, the, on the left, um, you'll see that um, the first pillar is basically to engage in horizon scanning of technologies. Um, looking at what's going on in the financial technology space and, and uh, advising uh, central banks of, of what's happening. On the extreme right, we'll see that we, we uh, also provide a focal point for a network of central bank experts on innovation. But it's really the middle pillar that is the, the bread and butter of what the innovation hub does. Um, we um, basically develop technology projects using new innovative technologies like blockchain and artificial intelligence to seek to address particular problems in the financial sector of importance to central banks. Uh, we will build proof of concepts, like experimental uh, proof of concepts, prototypes, or, or minimum viable products that we then share as public goods with the central bank and community fund. So the innovation hub in some ways is something I think quite new. It's like a tech startup inside an established international financial institution. Let me explain this in terms of a production possibility fund here. Basically, the, the, the central banks are, are designed or built to produce two public goods, monetary and financial stability. And what the innovation app tries to do is to use the power of technology to make them more effective in delivering uh, these public goods. Um, over the course of the past four and a half years, we've done over 30 cutting edge projects in different areas of importance to central banks. And our project portfolio is divided among six uh, strategic teams that really reflect the priorities of the central banking community. Uh, supervisory and regulatory technology, uh, next generation financial market infrastructures, <coughs> central bank digital currencies or CBDC, which we'll talk a lot about, um, open finance, cybersecurity, and green finance. And uh, while the majority of our projects have focused in the area of central bank digital, particularly if you look at the numbers on this slide, we are uh, branching out into other areas more and more and are experimenting. An important area uh, that we're really trying to improve in the international monetary and financial system is the field of cross-border payments. You might try, really might ask yourself, is it so easy to send a video around the world? Why can't you do the same with money? The answer is the cross-border payments, I think, leave a lot of room for improvement. Let me just uh, ask you now, how many people here have had to send a cross-border payment, payment to another country? How many of you have enjoyed the experience? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that sort of answers the question, but I think, it, you know, really, um, in all aspects of the, of the financial system, whether you're talking about large uh, corporate or financial institutions or individuals, the current system contains a lot of friction. In the case of, of you know, big institutions, when even when they're sending large amounts of money, they have to often to rely on correspondent banking arrangements where the payment may have to go through multiple banks in different countries before it reaches its destination. And it can be a very complicated process of time. Uh, for individuals, I think we all know that it can be low, opaque, very expensive, and very frustrating. And you know you can think of people in a country like the United States may have to send money home as a family remittance to family members in a, in a developing country. Uh, it can be a very expensive process for five to ten percent of the amount of up in fees. It can take days, and you can never be quite sure how much money will actually arrive. So obviously, this is unacceptable, and it's incumbent both, I think, on the private sector but also the public sector to do their part in trying to make the system better. And it's for that reason that the G20, the group of, uh, uh, of 20 countries, in 2020 called upon the Financial Stability Board in Basel and other stakeholders uh, to put in place and implement a roadmap of actions that were designed to address 
particular pain points or frictions in the current system from the people. And they, well, the result of this was a roadmap of 19 so-called building blocks, each of which was designed to deal with a particular thing. Some of these things deal with very basic things like extending operating hours for payment systems in, juris to, in different jurisdictions so that the payment systems in the two jurisdictions in, through which a transfer is made will be open at the same time for a longer period during the day. But some of these building blocks look at the power of technology to really shape the financial system of the world. And for two of these building blocks, the DIS Innovation Hub is called upon to co-lead the work in these areas. Building block 19, that looks at the um, potential for central bank digital currencies to improve the current system for cross-border payments, what I would call enabling the new. And building block 17, that looks at the potential to take existing payments arrangements and to connect them through multilateral payments platforms, what I would call improving the old. <coughs> I'd like to present these two different approaches to you. So let's start with the new things with, with central bank digital currencies. I do think that they are an example of something really new. First of all, what is the CBDC? Well, a central bank digital currency, as the slide shows, is a form of digital money nominated the national unit of account, which is a direct liability of the central bank. And it's a form of so-called central bank money, which is money issued by the central bank and it's a liability of the central bank. Currently in, in, the, in the universe today, there are two types of central bank money. For individuals, there are the bank notes that you have in your pocket. Those are a liability of the central bank. And the other form are reserve accounts that big financial institutions have acquired to maintain with the central bank. They can be distinguished from so-called commercial bank money, which is money issued by a private financial institution, bank, most typically represented by, uh, by the deposit that you hold with your bank. So central bank digital currencies are therefore a new form, a digital form of central bank money that is designed really for the financial system. Come in two main forms, retail CBDC, CBDC. Starting with retail CBDC, these are intended, like banknotes, for general purpose use, and they're accessible for households and businesses. They're a little bit like digital cash, but that would be, I think, an oversimplification. A wholesale CBDC is designed for use by financial institutions. Similar to the, to the, the reserve accounts that, that, that uh, commercial banks uh, often hold with, with the central bank in this country. They're basically intended for settlement of large internal bank payments or to provide a settlement asset uh, for transactions, like, uh, for example, on a, a new distributed ledger that would trade tokenized financial assets like tokenized. So both types, both wholesale and retail, are, are relevant for, uh, for cross-border payments. So I think first, uh, I think the question is, a lot of people, you know, what is the point of CBDC? I think the real question is, can they really improve the current system? I think a lot of central banks are looking at this question now, and they're very uh, actively researching the potential for both wholesale and retail CBDC. Currently in the world, there are four retail central bank digital currencies that are already in operation. In the Bahamas, uh, the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, the Nigeria and Jamaica. And there are thir in 37 other jurisdictions where there are currently pilots underway of either wholesale or retail CBDC. I think as many of you know, the United States is also looking at the potential for central bank. The Federal Reserve Board conducted a public consultation on CBDC. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, in collaboration with MIT, um, developed a theoretical high-performance transaction process for the CBDC in Project Hamilton. And the New York Innovation Center of the New York Fed uh, explored the feasibility for distributed ledger technology to facilitate safe and efficient wholesale. Uh, there are many different motivations why central banks might consider uh, issuing a CBDC, and you can see some of them shown on the slide, and the DIS conducts periodic surveys. Of, uh, 
And you know, different countries consider them for different circumstances, but gen uh, perhaps generally speaking for um, retail CBDCs, um, some central banks see this as a, a way of promoting financial inclusion for bringing people who are currently outside the formal financial system into the formal financial system, or for as a way of uh, facilitating more um, for greater payments efficiency, including at the domestic level. Um, for wholesale CBDC, uh, there, there are different motivations. Some of these relate to uh, the mechanism for improving quality, which I'll, I'll go into, but also as, as to serve as settlement assets for trading platforms. But I think what is fair to say is that work in this area is very complex. And um, what is really clear is that central banks, regardless of their motivations, have a great need to understand the technological potential and possibilities uh, for central bank digital currency. This is where the innovation hub uh, comes in. I'd now like to turn to the practical experience of the innovation hub um, with uh, uh, central bank digital currency. As I mentioned earlier, um, we've done a lot of work in this area. We have 13 projects currently. And as you'll see from the slide, the majority of these projects are, are in the domestic retail CBDC uh, um, um, area and the cross-border wholesale CBDC. Go into each, but I'll start maybe now with uh, our, our work on, with domestic central bank digital currency. You'll see the little flags beside each of the project names. I should first say, please don't ask me to explain um, the logic behind the project names. Uh, that's a, a trade secret that we never disclose, <laughs> largely because I can't explain. <laughs> um, but uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, basically all of our different hub centers are working on different experimentations in this space. Uh, if you look um, in the domestic wholesale, you'll see projects Helvetia 1 and 2. These were um, came out of our Swiss center. They were collaborations with the Swiss National Bank, the Central Bank of Switzerland, and the Swiss Exchange, the trading infrastructure in Switzerland, that basically placed a wholesale CBDC on a distributed ledger platform with tokenized securities so that you could settle in, in real time and atomically securities trades with central bank money. Um, our retail, um, uh, it, uh, domestic retail experiments all look at what is really the same as the, the type of model that most central banks are considering for retail CBDC. Two-tiered model where uh, a central bank, the central bank would maintain a ledger uh, uh, that upon which the central bank digital currency would sit and be traded. But all of the customer safe facing services including the information about individual customers would be held on a second layer by private firms who would be, would be service providers for their customers. And, you know, these various pro, uh, projects, you'll see Project Orem uh, from our Hong Kong center with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Sela was a, again, a Hong Kong center project with collaboration with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the Central Bank of Israel. Project Rosalind and our London Center with the Bank of England. Project Polaris um, in, um, in our Nordic Center. Uh, and finally, Project Turbillon uh, in, our, in our Swiss Center. And these projects, I think, have shown the, the great potential uh, the, for, for domestic retail CBDC. And we've learned a number of lessons, uh, in particular having to do with the ways in which technology can be used to balance privacy, the need to preserve customer privacy with the need to guard against money laundering and terrorist financing, uh, the way we can mitigate cyber risks, the way these systems can operate, even if um, the cell phone network that you wanna make a payment through your cell phone down, so offline capabilities. And our findings are really being shared uh, with the central banking community to help inform their own work uh, in this way. Now, you know, I, I mentioned that um, you know, the Innovation Hub is really a technology hub. And the core of our work is actually exploring the potential for technology to solve problems in the financial sector. But in the area of, of CBDC, domestic CBDC, uh, it's not limited to that. We are looking, for example, at some of the legal uh, considerations around a domestic CBDC. You know, how would you design a legal framework to support a central bank digital currency if you issued one? 
And we're doing some of this work in collaboration with some of the member central banks of EIS. And you know, I have to say at this point that we've uh, identified a lot more questions than we've provided answers for. And you know, the legal framework for any CBDC would depend very much on how the CBDC was designed, what the design features were, and also certainly the, the, the legal traditions and legal system of the relevant uh, jurisdiction. But suffice it to say that any country that was con contemplating issuing uh, a central bank of the currency would have to really uh, be prepared for significant legal reform. Dealing with questions such as, you know, does the central bank have the power to actually issue a central bank of currency? The legislation that authorizes central banks to, to operate typically will not refer to a central bank of the currency. These, some of these statutes are very old, long before anyone had heard of the CBDC. They'll, they'll look at, they'll, they'll contain provisions that have the power to issue banknotes or currency or open accounts. So these raise important legal questions. Um, comprehensive rule books will have to be placed, uh, put in place to determine how payments are made and when is a payment final. What happens if someone holding a CBDC becomes insolvent? What about fraud? All these questions have to be addressed. And I think critically, um, the legal framework will have to draw an appropriate balance between the need for privacy and the need to enable the authorities to fight against money laundering and terrorist financing. For example, should be, there be circumstances like cash, so you can make all these questions are questions and legislators and policymakers and jurisdictions. Let me turn now to the use of cross uh, central banks to address cross border payments. And um, here I think the BIS is really playing its part to try to advance the. Uh, all through the innovation hub. And before I go into the way in which these projects are designed, let me say, maybe give you a bit of a thumbnail for what the projects actually are. Um, the cross-border um, wholesale CBDC projects are all experimentations that explore a, a, the same basic model that we'll go into in a second. Um, but just to give you a flavor for the types of cooperation that's ongoing, The project Jura uh, is um, a project out of our Swiss center that was done in collaboration with the Swiss National Bank and the Bank of France. Project Dunbar from our Singapore center was done with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Central Bank of Malaysia, and the Reserve Banks of uh, South Africa and Australia. Enbridge, which I'll talk about in some detail, is ongoing. It's out of our Hong Kong center. And we're doing this um, in collaboration with um, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. In addition to that, there are actually 25 observing members of this project, including uh, the New York Fed. Um, Mariana, which was a joint project of our Swiss, Singapore, and Eurosystem centers, involved the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, the Bank de France, and the Swiss National Bank. Uh, finally, Project Mandela, again out of Singapore, was done with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. It's ongoing, actually, the Bank of Korea, the Reserve Bank of Australia, and the Central Bank of Finally, Icebreaker, which is a retail uh, cross-border project, was done with the Swedish Riksbank. Uh, so these projects uh, explore the potential for different models to improve the current system for making and you know, to give you, uh, I guess, an example for um, um, the cross-border wholesale cases, basically they involve a model called a single platform. And the way this works, it, we, if you think of the current system for making cross-border institutional payments, as I mentioned, they will use the corresponding banking system. Payment may have to go through multiple correspondent banks in different jurisdictions, each of, of which performs a role and they Take a cut in terms of a fee, and this can is a slow, can be slow, expensive, and, and what um, these projects do, Enbridge in particular, is that it takes a single distributed ledger platform, and um, you have different central banks, each of which will issue its own wholesale central bank digital currency onto the platform, so that they can be traded 
directly between central banks and large financial institutions so they can settle payments, cross-border payments, basically, almost instantaneously, without having to go through different corresponding banks. Um, this type of um, system has shown enormous potential in that it significantly reduces costs, it makes settlement much faster, and it also increases operational uh, transparency. So in other words, faster, cheaper, and simpler cross-border payments. Project Icebreaker, uh, which is a retail system, takes a completely different approach. Uh, and here you have three theoretical, in this case, hypothetical uh, retail central bank digital currencies by Israel, Norway, and Sweden. And instead of trying to put them all on the same platform, uh, we created a hub and spoke model in which you have the icebreaker hub that each of them connects to um, so that uh, the payment can be made effectively you know, um, through the hub instantaneously for retail payments between countries are almost instantaneous. This also showed enormous potential, but for different reasons, it allows each jurisdiction enormous flexibility in designing its domestic system without having to make sure that everything is identical between the two systems. But obviously for both of these, these, these approaches and further work, so I'll say briefly a word about um, the, the law. Obviously, the technology is only one part of it in designing these different approaches, but legal frameworks also have to be addressed, including what is the what is the legal nature of the platform, what is the governing law, who has responsibility to oversee the platform. But importantly, particularly for the for some of the the, the multi CBDC arrangements, who makes the decisions. You know, central banks guard very closely their concern, their control over their own currencies. And if you live in a world where they're placing their own currencies on a platform with other currencies, governance and decision making becomes very quick. Important questions that need to be addressed. So that's a picture of, a, of enabling the new. I'd now I'd like to say just a few brief words about improving the old. And this uh, goes to a second way in which we are thinking to address the challenges around cross-border payments. And that is taking existing systems and connecting them. You know, uh, in the world of retail payments, there are a growing number of countries are putting in place something called the fast payment system. The US recently did with uh, something called FedNow. But basically it's a system that operates 24 seven. Uh, you can use it typically on your cell phone and it allows you to make a payment often without a bank account number of the recipient through a cell phone number or uh, an email address or something, to make the payment almost instantaneously for immediate credit on a 24 seven basis. These are becoming very popular uh, in, in both um, industrialized uh, emerging market and also in developing countries. And there's pretty good coverage globally. There are currently 60 in operation. And I think there are another 30 that are 20 or 30 that are planned uh, in the coming years. Uh, and these systems are based on commercial bank rather than central bank money. But a basic problem with respect to cross-border payments is that they only operate domestically. You can't make a cross-border payment using one of these platforms. So what, what we did, um, in something called Project Nexus in our Singapore center is to, uh, create something called a nexus gateway. Or the, the nexus, what, what it does is create a gateway under which um, uh, different uh, payment systems from different countries can connect to each other. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you have roughly over 60 of these systems in operation today. You know, one way of connecting them so that people could make payments across borders through connected systems um, would be if you establish bilateral connections amongst all these different systems that would require you to put in place 1,700 bilateral links, which obviously is not a very efficient way of doing it. So what the Nexus Gateway is, is a, a, a system under which each domestic fast payment system can connect to the Nexus Gateway that we created through our Singapore Center. And by doing that, they can connect with all the other fast payment systems that have also connected. So through a single link, you can link with everybody else who's on the system. 
And this will work in such a way that you can make uh, uh, for a retail payment, um, a payment across borders in no more than about 60 seconds. And this uh, project of ours has attracted enormous attention amongst the people. And so much so that we're currently working with five um, uh, central banks in the ASEAN region, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, um, um, and, in, um, and the Philippines, um, where they're going to take the Nexus blueprint and um, use it to create a regional fast payment system that will connect over 500 million people that will be able to operate for retail payments by individuals at least across this network for instantaneous payments. But as they say, you know, I think a picture or a video is worth a thousand words. What I'd like to do now is to show you a very short video that explains how Project Nexus actually works. from one person to another has never been easier. That's if you're sending money within the same country. If you're sending money overseas, it can feel like an eternity. But why? Money is just data. Why does it take longer to send money overseas than it does to send an email? Well, there are three reasons. First, one currency needs to be swapped for another. Second, compliance checks are needed to prevent illicit payments. And third, different payment systems speak different languages. These steps can result in costs, frictions, and delays. Payment innovators and organizations like SWIFT are developing better solutions and standards for data and messaging. But there's still more that we can do. So, here at the BIS Innovation Hub in Singapore, we're exploring other options. One possibility is to link the successful fast payment systems that many countries use today for domestic payments. In fact, Singapore and Thailand are already connecting their fast payment systems, making money transfers happen within seconds. The European Central Bank and the Swedish Riksbank are also exploring ways they can achieve instant payments between euros and kroners. It's a positive step forward, but linking countries one by one can quickly become a challenge. Two countries need just one link, but four countries need six links, and 20 countries need 190 links. This gets complicated and expensive. That's why the BIS Innovation Hub is developing a blueprint for a fast, cross-border payments platform. We call it Nexus for short. Nexus does two things. First, it connects multiple fast payment systems in different countries, thereby allowing them to speak to each other through standardized data-rich payment messages. Second, it coordinates currency exchange between financial institutions. That means the existing domestic fast payment systems could start to provide equally fast cross-border payments, all without the sender's bank or the fast payment system having to touch another currency. Nexus is a blueprint to connect the multiple fast payment systems that exist today. We're working with the Monetary Authority of Singapore and other central banks to ensure that technology on the horizon will make it easier than ever for both businesses and individuals to send money across borders. So maybe just in, in, in closing, I should share, I mean, and sort of alluded to this, but I moved over from the IMF to the BIS four and a half years ago. I was the first employee in the Innovation Hub. It really has been like setting up a startup in a big international financial institution. It's been, um, it's been quite, a, quite a journey. But, uh, we've gone from one person to over 90, well, about 90 people now, and when the Toronto Center built them, we're about 95 globally. Um, but I have to say that it's been, um, one of the most exciting and rewarding things I've ever done, uh, as I think many of the people who work in the innovation hub also feel. Um, and the important thing is that times are really changing. 
but I think the demand, the, the, the purpose of central banks to preserve the stability and efficiency of the, of the, of the monetary system domestically and globally remains the same. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ross. That was fascinating. And I encourage all of you to look at the uh, Innovation Hub website because on all of these projects that Ross has mentioned, there are reports. They're very detailed. They're really fascinating. I mean, the breadth and depth of the projects you're doing is really quite incredible. The scope of innovation that's going on around the world and quite a number of countries involved. And, you know, CBDCs in some ways I think practically all the countries involved haven't actually issued one or even maybe decided to issue one. And those may be still a few years away, maybe several years away, but something like Project Nexus, we were talking this morning, that could be operational within a couple of years and link 500 million people, I think you said, in five countries, yeah. where it would just be like using Apple Pay and, or, you know, Google Pay or whatever, and you're sending money abroad to anyone, even perhaps just using their phone number or something like that. So really quite extraordinary. But I do want to ask a question about CBDCs. And, and you know, a few years ago, when we started talking about CBDCs, it almost seems to me like first people said, well, wholesale CBDC, that's not really any different because banks already have reserve accounts at the Fed and that's digital money. So it's really retail CBDCs that's the, that's the exciting thing. And then it was like people started thinking about the privacy implications of, of retail CBDCs and the effects on the banking system. And there was sort of more hesitancy. And even in this country, quite a bit of political opposition now. And at the same time, people said, well, wait a minute, wholesale CBDCs could actually be very important in terms of just settling the uh, transactions in other tokenized assets. If we thought that we could tokenize other things, whether that's stocks, bonds, real estate, whatever, you need a settlement currency, which could be a wholesale CBDC. So I wonder, is that a fair kind of statement about kind of what's happened over the last few years? Or do you feel like, um, we're still moving fast on both fronts with retail and wholesale CBDC. Well, you know, I think you have to distinguish what's going on in individual countries versus what's going on globally. Mm -hmm. And the, the truth is that, you know, in some countries, the concerns are being expressed about uh, some of the privacy implications. Of, you know, if you had a system where the central bank might know how you're spending your money and the state has access to all this information, that makes some people very uncomfortable, obviously. First of all, I have to say that's not really the model anyone's contemplating, <laughs> that, but it does raise those concerns. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, it, so different countries are, are sort of moving in different directions. There are many countries that are still exploring the potential for, wholesale, for retail CBDC, even though they haven't said they're actually going to issue one. Um, the, 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 Euro, the Euro system, for example, the European Central Bank is working quite hard as is the Bank of England. Part of the reason for this is that anybody who wants to issue a retail central bank of currency, you're talking about years of work. Well, even if you're not, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're not planning on issuing one now, I think you have to keep <clears throat> moving forward with experimentation and preparation in the event that you may to do so. But it is true that, you know, people are sort of, I think, also becoming very aware of the great potential for wholesale CBDC. And I think the reason is that they are um, sort of the next generation beyond something like a reserve account. And I would encourage you to have a look at um, the, the 2023, chapter three of the 2023 <laughs> annual economic report, EBIS, which lays out um, a vision that was I think, articulated by Iverson Parsons, the general manager of the BIS, for what he calls a unified ledger. But the basic idea is that a uh, wholesale CBDC, unlike a reserve account, can be placed on a blockchain. Uh, it can be programmed, it's like smart contracts, uh, to do certain things upon certain events. It can be combined on a blockchain or a distributed ledger with other types of assets like tokenized 
deposit with uh, commercial banks might be uh, tokenized securities or other financial assets. And the idea is that if you put all these things on the same ledger or at least different ledgers that are connected, they can be through things, uh, things like programmability and composability and through smart contracts, you can combine different operations into a single operation that either settles or fails. So it, it's a fundamentally different universe that could operate 24-7 um, in ways that are far more efficient than one exists today. And when you say blockchain, are we talking about Ethereum and Cardano and Solana, or are we talking about something else? Well, first of all, I should talk about <laughs> distributed ledgers or different types <laughs> right. of ledgers, but you're talking about permission ledgers, typically. Yeah. Um, something that would be designed for specific use by, by for example, banks or regulated financial institutions. And that's a pretty basic dividing line here. I mean, the, you, we're not talking about stable coins, for example, or other crypto currencies? No. Um, well, first of all, I think that the, the central banking world is learning from um, innovation in the crypto space. You know, in a, some of our own projects, um, like Project Mariana, we've actually taken techniques that were developed in the DeFi universe and are applying, applying them for a platform for wholesale CBDC. But um, you know these these are very different from that. And yeah. I think you know, you know the, uh, the BIS in particular, the central bank, concerns about the risk posed by you know, what we call pure cryptocurrencies, but even stable coins. Mm -hmm. So, so I think these questions about blockchain and what which technologies are actually going to be used. I want to move get your just to yeah. another issue. You didn't mention all the, the film did, which is the foreign exchange piece of this. So both cross-border wholesale and also Project Nexus, not just moving the payment, you're doing a conversion. And you're doing it a lot of across a lot of different currencies. And that's been a challenge just in, in general. But how do you think about integrating the pricing so that you have near instantaneous transactions? a lot of <clears throat> matches and sort of how much of a problem is that for users? It was well, a problem, but I think it's one that's being addressed in different ways. You know, first of all, if you look at some of the wholesale DLT platforms like, like um, um, Enbridge, um, the idea is that you could have the, the currency sitting on the platform may not be the additional reserve currency for US dollars, for example. And these, these uh, platforms can enable direct exchanges between the currency. But you know, one of the challenges is coming out for a price for the conversion. In particular with Enbridge right now, that's all being done off chain. But over time, um, you can come up with ways of in trading into these platforms, the markets for trading a particular currency. And in Project Mariana, for example, um, which I mentioned, which it would be basically a, um, a liquidity pool um, that would sit at the international level above the different domestic level. So a lot more work needs to be done. Puzzle that also needs to be solved. Russ, can I just jump over just another category? Um, BIS is doing this you know, terrific work and the reports are wonderful. I mean, you all go to the website and, and look around, it's, it's, it's great. Um, but there are a lot of other organizations that are that are involved here. So you mentioned the FSB, this cross-border issue, for example, is on the G20 agenda for later this year. How did, is progress gonna be made at BIS, or just contemplate that some other group, a G20 or G something else, is going to, at some point, since sign off on the solution? Or just, what's the relationship between what you're doing and the G20? Well, we obviously work very closely um, with you know other other you know stakeholders within the system, and some of our projects, for example, feed into work that's being done. In Roadmap, for example. Um, there's important policy work being done, but something like Nexus is actually 
um, a project that that um, informed um, some of the work being done on the platform. What the innovation hub is doing is develop showing what technology technology can do is providing practical experience that first of all central banks and other stakeholders can take in developing their own solutions but it's also I think informing policy and I think this is one of the um, strengths I think that the BIS itself has you know if you again if you look on our website you'll see the cutting edge analysis that the BIS economists do is something like the annual economic report they really you know under August and Carson's leadership um, and Hyun Shin, so, um, they've really been, uh, I think, intellectual leaders in the area of CBDC and payments. But, you know, because the BIS also has the innovation hub, they're able to combine their conceptual analysis and practical to actually feed off of each other. How should we think about all of the work on multilateral platforms, whether it's linking up the old existing systems or CBDCs in terms of the implications for the dollar. Um, the dollar is, is the primary currency used in international payments. And I'm not talking about the dollar as a reserve asset and in people's investment in treasuries, but rather just as a currency of payment. And, and how should we think about its effects on that? And for example, today, so many international payments run through SWIFT and that's just a messaging service. It's not exactly an actual payment service. But are we moving toward a world which is more multipolar and multi-currency? Or do you think, boy, that's still a long way off? Um, how, how do you think about that at the BIS? Um, I don't know. But if so, I can put you on the spot. Sure, maybe bit. how I think about it personally. <laughs> I, I, I think personally that we're... Well, the truth is that you know some of these new platforms may not have to use the dollar, uh, and that they will um, they could um, facilitate you know exchanges of currencies directly, as I, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. Enbridge or, mm -hmm. or even something like Icebreaker. But I think uh, we're still you know first of all the importance of a currency isn't just dictated by its use on a platform. Right. Uh, it's based on a lot of important things like the size of the economy, the size of the, the markets, national trade, and that, you know, I think that the technology is going to be there for a long time. But yeah, in, in terms of where technology leads us in the future and where the, dollar, the role of the dollar plays in that role, well, it's very hard to say. Let's open it up to questions from the audience. Yeah. So I would like to understand your perception on dollars in general, like there are patients or not. What concerns you? Like, do you see? Well, you know, as I said, I think the dollars, you know, within the with the crypto currency space, it's something that um, policymakers in places places like the BIS are concerned about because they. Um, uh, you know, crypto markets generally are in some ways self-referential. Um, they are, you know, unregulated. Um, they um, uh, are uh, are subject to wild swings, and is, some people point to the risk that they pose for, for, for money laundering. But I, I, I do think that the central banking world, the official sector, can learn a lot from what's going on in that space. Uh, through the types of decentralized um, um, platforms that we're now building ourselves, including something like the multi CBDC uh, platform that I described, in the sense that uh, something like Enbridge is um, it's basically you know it's an arrangement between, between central banks that will put, you know depending on the governance structure could sit outside some sort of governing entity. It could basically be a series of rules that they simply agree to and implement. With each other on a decentralized basis, which, depending how you look at this, is a reflection of, of what's been learned, I think, in the crypto space. I think even if uh, central banks have concerns about this, uh, the, some of the implications of the crypto world, I think we can learn a lot from it. Well, just to follow up on this sort of tide of innovation and how you think about it, in addition to the DAO sort of area, there is 
uh, the regulated liability network <coughs> project. There's sort of these pri private projects that you know could be tokenized deposits. It could be sort of private digital money that could also could also be an alternative approach. Um, and I and I don't know whether I think about that as building on the old or something <laughs> new, but it's it's sort of a a pathway that's not central bank oriented, although might be overseen by central bank. So how do you think about that kind of private innovation? Sure. Well first of all, we work very closely with the private sector generally. You know, all of these projects that I've mentioned have very uh, strong um, uh, reliance upon private sector partners, either as full partners or, or as you know, uh, firms that we hire to help us build the technology. But um, you know, something like a regulated liability network it demonstrates that these things can't exist in isolation of each other. And it, I think, is a reflection of the type of work that the BIS is now uh, trying to move forward on with the, uh, the unified ledger, where you have um, wholesale CBDC sitting on the same platform with tokenized deposits issued by private financial institutions and serving as a settlement asset for, for uh, transfers between. Yeah. So it, I think it all has to fit together and we'll have to work with the private sector and trying to develop, develop some of these things. Okay, question in the back. Uh, again. I think the question was how does how does a CBDC affect the relationship of the central bank to banks? Is that bank runs? Bank runs. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question, and you know, um, it's, concerns have been, been expressed by some, including banks, that if you issue a central bank digital currency. Basically, everyone will take their money out of the banks and hold it in CBDC, and their bank's depositories will sort of evaporate, and this will undermine financial stability and the bank runs. Um, first of all, I, I personally, you know, I don't think that um, that should be a major concern. I think one of the fundamental principles of the work being done on, on CBDC by central banks is something called do no harm, which means that the introduction of the CBDC should not undermine the uh, central bank's objectives of pursuing monetary and financial stability. Um, and, you know, with respect to uh, the potential for bank runs, you know, I think the extent that, simple, that commercial banks feel threatened, it may not be just from, from CBDCs, but from other forms of new digital assets like, like stable coins. But, you know, there have been studies that have been done on the potential for uh, CBDC to effect of the deposit base of, of um, banks. Uh, they found that they, the risk can be managed. And secondly, with respect to CBDC, central banks would have at their disposal um, design choices that could, under, that could limit the risk of this happening. In particular, many central banks are considering um, uh, imposing holding limits on the amount of CBDC that individuals could hold either in terms of an absolute amount or the, ten, the number of, of the amount or the number of transactions that they could engage in over a particular period. So it could be done, done in a way that would not sort of drain the, the banking system of, of its deposits. And in the event, I think we also have to remember that people will probably continue to keep their money in banks because they get all kinds of other services around it, including the payment of interest, which may not be the case with the CBDC. Uh, going back to Embrick, I'm trying to understand exactly how payments will work. And the question I have is, when, say, you have Thailand and China transacting, are they going to be holding more renminbi and Thai baht so the currency exchange can happen? Or, um, like, I don't get how it's instantaneous and how the banks go over there. Well, um, a bank, the no, way. No, no. I'm going to try to walk through a transaction on Embridge without messing this up. <laughs> um, but basically, if you're a customer in, in, say, China and you want to make a payment to someone in, in Thailand, you would go to your bank. Uh, you would, you know, pay your your Chinese renminbi. That bank um, would then um, make a. Um, um, it would make a transfer to the. Uh, 
the commercial the, it, it, on the Enbridge platform, it would transfer <laughs> currency to the, the commercial bank of the recipient. Okay, it would then receive the payment and then would make a transfer to its its um, its own customer. But who's doing the FX conversion there? Well, it would be between the two banks on the platform. Basically. The two commercial banks? Yes. Not the central banks? No. Well, the commercial banks um, would hold um, CBDCs of each country. On the platform of each country, or if they didn't have them, they could buy them from each other. Okay, let's go here. And then... Well, that's a very good question. I think you know it's not our not our place to promote and to sort of push an agenda towards one solution or the other, but to show the possibilities of both. Um, and you know, if we produce particular solutions and central banks come to us to help them implement it, we we may do that as we are currently with Nexus. Um, and I do think that I, I do see it um, benefits in trying to push to to continue to experiment and move forward with the different options, because in some ways they're solving different problems. Um, one thing I perhaps I should have mentioned or emphasized a little bit more is that domestic fast payment systems provide a solution for retail payments. So individuals or small businesses making payments with each other, to, you know, to and from each other. They don't really solve the big institutional problems. Whereas something like um, Enbridge, or another um, wholesale CBDC platform might, even if it takes longer, I think we have to continue to experiment with these different options. But I do agree that you know, something like Nexus does hold enormous potential to at least with respect to retail payments for those countries that have domestic fast payment systems to make a difference relatively soon. One of the things, though, to remember that you touched on briefly, but I think it's very important, especially for people at the Kennedy School, to keep in mind, this isn't just about technology. The, the governance and operational oversight issues in creating these multilateral platforms are huge. Yes. And while on the one hand, one has you know this nice diagram of Nexus says, okay, we don't have to have 190 links, you know, we only have to have a few, you still have to figure out a very complicated governance structure yeah. and even then adding countries to that i would assume would raise a lot of interesting issues i mean that exists with cbdc's too but that's kind of it's great space for kennedy school students so <laughs> yes Making something like Nexus operational? Yeah, or? operational so that these uh, private companies, they, they are, they are uh, startups mm -hmm. currently which make yeah. currency. Yes. So our timeline is in a second when we read about macroeconomics. So will this like, financial crisis, like when, like, <laughs> so I, I suppose Argentina currency is there, and then I think that the economy will go down. So all citizens uh, then take. USD, and which was happening in say six months or one year, now it will happen in say one year. <laughs> sure, well, those are good questions. So, first of all, you know, to put any of these things in place it takes a few years. Uh, Kim, you're absolutely right that the technology is only one part of this. And, and I would encourage people to look, for example, at the report for Nexus that goes into the most recent report that goes into some of the governance 
uh, consideration to the, the need to establish an operating entity in a jurisdiction in which the different stakeholders would have a voice. You know, it, there's a lot of work that has to be done on that and on the supporting legal arrangements, et cetera. Um, so the answer to the question is put any of these things in place, you're looking at several years of work. Um, but, you know, with something like Nexus, at the domestic level, these systems are, are doing very well. And the, the, the payment service providers that are part of them are also will, will continue to exist in, in most cases. Um, you know, with respect to the um, potential um, cross border implications of uh, uh, issuing CBDC, this is, I think, is the international element of, what I, of the principle of do no harm, if I can call it that, in the sense that I think there's a recognition now that, you know, any major jurisdiction that is considering issuing a retail central bank digital currency will have to consider the implications of that for other jurisdictions. You know, the, many countries experience a phenomenon called dollarization where citizens basically have no faith in the domestic currency and they hold all their savings in dollars or another, you know, um, widely traded uh, convertible currency. You know, there is a scenario where if a big jurisdiction issues a, a, a retail CBDC and allows non-residents to hold it, you know, you could have, you know, large parts of, it, of a, a population in a developing country, for example, choosing to hold that CBDC rather than their own currency, which will undermine the ability of the, the central bank in that country to conduct monetary policy and will expose the country to uh, large and destabilizing spillovers. So the, 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 the do no harm element in that context would require, I think, or at least it would be incumbent on uh, the, the larger jurisdiction to consider to what extent it would allow non-residents to hold its currency or not under what circumstances. Bob. <clears throat> As this is to a, you and uh, all the lawyers, I want to ask a bit of a legal question. Um, the move of refer to wholesale or reserve bank money and central bank money interacting on a daily basis as wholesale CBDC, opposed to just something that's always been happening for the last 50 years in digital format, does that require, say, for example, and how to the US and obviously maybe for other jurisdictions that work for you? Would that require prescribed legislation, right? To you know, we, we updated the database of the Federal Reserve System about 50 years ago. We didn't have to do special, a lot of special legislation to do that. I think we need most of these countries, big countries, need to consider thinking about also is special legislation required to do it, or is this business as usual just changing the machine? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to let you answer this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I really can't speak for the U.S., but I, again, I, I can't imagine any jurisdiction issuing a CBDC retail, or for that matter, even potentially wholesale, without legal reform. With retail, I think the case is overwhelming. <laughs> uh, for wholesale, you're talking about a new type of tokenized digital asset that would be sitting on a platform with private financial assets. So first of all, you get into governance. And regulation, it would be a financial market infrastructure that would be subject to part of the uh, CPMI, the principles on financial market infrastructures. Um, you also get into issues of the legal status of the token. You get into issues around the rule book. Uh, you get into issues around the extent to which certain types of tokenized financial assets, like the security, would be native to the blockchain, to the distributed ledger, or whether they would be a representation of something that legally exists somewhere else. All of these questions would have to be addressed in the legal framework, and I would think would have to be considered in you. Yeah, I, I think there is a lot to be worked out here. It's not simple, you know, updating the technology of the machine. I mean, Ross invited me to a meeting in Basel where we had a number of lawyers discussing the implications, and I just remember we, we spent several hours just trying to decide what is it? What is a CBDC? <laughs> is exactly. it cash? Is it this? Is it that? It's complicated. Uh, my prediction about getting into legal status is if this conversation is had, I'm not sure the word CBDC yeah. would be used. Uh, right. Because I think that it's that right. so much associated with retail. And so you might have a different way of talking. The other thing I will know for people is one of the interesting things that's happening on the legal side of these issues is there is a, a very active development in the US at the state level of thinking about what are the implications of digital assets broadly in terms of how you settle things, how you transact. 
we have something called the Uniform Commercial Code that many of you may be familiar with. And there's a whole set of amendments that deal with digital assets, which is a very important development. Another question, yeah. First of all, I should explain that they, they operate a little bit differently in the sense that the, the Enbridge model or some of our other wholesale CBD key arrangements, everything is on a single platform. Nexus is a gateway that connects independent systems together. Um, as to who would manage this, uh, there are different governance models that can be considered. In the case of Nexus, the, what, what is under consideration as in, in, the, in, the, in the most re recent report we published is uh, a, an operating entity that would be incorporated uh, in a particular jurisdiction. In the case of Enbridge, um, it doesn't have to be that. It can simply be, uh, in some ways, an agreement uh, between the central banks uh, to, that adhere to a rule book, along with uh, some of the other participants in the system. You then need a governance arrangement to determine how decisions are made. But in both cases, the, the anti-money laundering checks are basically done before the payment goes through the platform. Um, by, in the case of Enbridge, the, the commercial banks that are running payments through Enbridge, or in the case of um, uh, Annexus, the payment service providers in the different soft payment systems. But that that implies that, I mean, both, both the payor and the payee jurisdictions are doing some sort of AML check before Correct. the payment actually moves. There's Correct. a moment in time where that happens before the payment happens. Correct. And with sanctions compliance, I remember looking at the Nexus report on this a little bit, and that sounded a little bit different as I recall, maybe not, but it's the same. It's the but same. I think what, what perhaps is a little bit different is that we are exploring technological approaches to help ease the burden of yeah. compliance. And if you look on our website, you'll see something called Project Mandela, which I think was on the slide, uh, again, out of our Singapore center with multiple central banks, where what we're trying to do on the distributed ledger platform, the wholesale CBDC platform, is to automate um, some of the, the um, compliance um, function that central banks, or uh, the commercial banks have to engage in, both for anti-money laundering controls and sanctions checks, but also where relevant capital control measures. I want to come back to privacy, but let's see if there's any other questions. Yes. What, what role, if any, existing players on the ground would have here? Or, or for instance, you know, a, some of the challenges with cost, effects, that's with you, benefits to the customer, the consumer. Uh, what could any potential fintechs uh, offer? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's hard to say, but I think anytime you build a new infrastructure, uh, you create opportunities for new types of service providers. And, you know, the, the argument that can be made that if you uh, put in place some of these arrangements, there'll be certain intermediaries who will no longer really be relevant. They may no longer have a role, but there can be uh, roles for new types of intermediaries in different circumstances. 
um, operating the platform to start with, but you know others as well. And so in the case of uh, Nexus, um, we have the in addition to the payment service providers, um, you have X FX providers that would be part of the system, and um, who would be uh, basically doing the foreign exchange conversion between the two relevant jurisdictions. In some cases, they may not have accounts in the two jurisdictions, or you have settlement account providers who would play that role. So yeah, I think anytime you create a new infrastructure, you create opportunities for the private sector to innovate and also provide services around it. And I, and I would say in the context of CBDCs also, a lot of what you hear today is a retail CBDC would be distributed through private firms, whether those are banks or other organizations. And you might have even separate from banks, you might have wallet providers, you know, which are not banks, but which are involved in that system. So, you know, because I think most people don't want to see central banks having that retail interaction. But, central but, banks don't want to. You know, central yeah. banks certainly don't. But on that point, let me just maybe close with the, the coming back to the privacy issue, because that has become now more of a concern about retail CBDCs, but you all are trying to do some projects on, you have some projects on that. Can you talk a little bit about what you're trying to do in terms of addressing those private, and the privacy concerns as you noted are that, gee, is the central bank going to be able to see all of my transactions or know all of my transactions and even you know, a politically motivated uh, central bank or a central bank that had to comply with some, you know, uh, uh, political leader, could they block what I was doing, or could they somehow, you know, scream what I'm doing? Sure, and absolutely. And again, you know, all of the the overwhelming majority of you know uh, of central banks who are looking at these th things are considering a two tiered model, where the central bank would run the ledger, and so where the, the CBDC sitting on it, but all of the customer facing services and all the customer data would be held by, by payment service providers on the, on the second layer who would do all the customer facing services. And all of our projects have looked at this basic model. Um, you, but I think it has to also be recognized that as is the case with the current system, um, you can't have complete privacy or more than that, anonymity. Um, you can make an anonymous payment in cash, but most jurisdictions, at a certain point, you, you can't buy a house with cash. You know, <laughs> There are limits on these things. And there are circumstances where banks, when they process a payment for someone because of concerns over anti-money laundering, or potent the potential for money laundering and terrorist financing, will need to take measures and report this to the state. Uh, the same will be true for a retail CBDC system. So that the design features with this two-tier model, as I said, they keep, they keep the customer data away from the central bank. Uh, they would uh, probably generally impose upon the payment service, the, the, the wallet service providers an obligation to report certain types of transactions. But, you know, we are focused, looking at the power of technology to address some of these issues. We have a project, or have had a project in Switzerland called Project Trubillon, where uh, we look at different privacy enhancing technologies that have ways of, um, what uh, is the word, uh, anonymizing or obfuscating yeah. the data, the personal data of who's actually made, uh, making the transaction. Yeah, it's a very interesting project because it really tries to design a CBDC to be more cash-like mm -hmm. in the sense that if I'm paying Ross, I get a token which isn't identified with me. I can transfer it to Ross the merchant, let's say, so he receives something and then isn't necessarily reused. Um, it just gets canceled because it, it isn't really identified with an account. Exactly right, exactly right. So, so, you know, and I think there are different design features that are under consideration among central banks as to whether for very small payments in CBDC would actually let that be anonymous the same way you could make a cash payment for an anonymous. But I, I think the question with all of this is, can we design the technology to achieve that, but also will people believe that the technology really does protect their personal information? So exactly. Maybe on that note, we'll close. Ross, thank you so much for spending this time with us. <laughs>